I am in Weatherford, Oklahoma, right alongside Route 66, and I am at the Stafford Air and Space Museum. This is supposed to be a really surprisingly good Air and Space Museum, uh, so we're going to go check this out. Out front, there's a Starfighter. This one was sent to Germany during the Berlin Crisis. It was also deployed during the Cuban Missile Crisis, in case that turned for the worse. And it also saw action in Vietnam. Here is a statue of General Thomas P. Stafford, the namesake of this museum who is originally from Weatherford. It's a really awesome statue with his astronaut gear on, staring up into the stars. Except he's just staring up at the awning. There's a right glider replica above the entrance, and because of COVID-19, gotta use some hand sanitizer. This museum is located at the Stafford Airport. So there's this lounge room with a mini Stafford statue and some cool pictures. They also have Stafford's Seat of the Pants Award in here. His award is a pair of name engraved space underpants. The museum starts off with an exhibit on the general himself. He was born here in Weatherford on September 17th, 1930, and would go on to become a legend. And he is still living as of the recording of this video. He is known as America's Space Ambassador, as since his retirement from NASA in 1975, he's continued to help with the space program and has had lots of knowledge and connections with the Russian space program. He's often been a key negotiator between the two countries' space programs. This American flag was flown in space on STS-79, the 17th flight of Space Shuttle Atlantis in 1996. Stafford helped with that. There's a bust of Stafford listing his accomplishments. He was America's 13th man in space, as he was a pilot on Gemini 6, the commander of Gemini 9, the commander of Apollo 10, chief of the astronaut office for a time, and commander of the Apollo Soyuz mission. But before all that, he grew up in this small Oklahoma town. There are some of his childhood toys, and his father was a local dentist, so there are some of the tools he used here. This was Lil Tom Stafford's copy of Huckleberry Finn. He was also in the Boy Scouts, so there's his neckerchief. And that was his Weatherford High School jacket from the 40s. Looks very vintage. He went on to the Naval Academy, where he got involved in naval aviation and the newly formed Air Force. He did become a fighter pilot for the Air Force, though he often got to use the older planes from the war, but he wanted to fly higher and faster than anyone, as he really wanted to work on the new experimental aircraft being worked on at the time. After a few years, he eventually got to become a test pilot like he wanted. This flight suit was worn by Stafford while he was the commanding general of the Air Force's Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base in California during the mid-70s. This is a model of the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk. This stealth fighter was developed in a highly secretive program led by Stafford during his days at the Pentagon. They proved pretty effective in Desert Storm against the Iraqi Army. This was Lieutenant General Stafford's uniform and certificate from 1979 when he retired from the Air Force, ending his illustrious military career. He received many fancy awards, some on display here, Perhaps the most prestigious was the Congressional Space Medal of Honor. Yes, there is a Space Medal of Honor for astronauts. It was presented to him by President George H.W. Bush for his feats of extraordinary accomplishment in space. And this is a portion of moon rock taken by Apollo 17 astronauts on the moon. That's been the last manned mission to the moon so far. Here's a room of artifacts from Stafford's astronaut days. In 1962, while working as a flight instructor, he applied to become a NASA astronaut. And he was selected as part of the second group of astronauts. This is his Harmon Trophy, a very historic and cool award dating back to 1926 for outstanding aviators. Stafford's last spaceflight was on the Apollo Soyuz Test Project, a joint mission with the Soviet Union in which two spacecraft from the two nations first linked up together in space. This friendship among enemies led to a successful international space link-up, and this is a replica of the docking ring between the two spacecraft. And there's a photo from Stafford during the mission inside the ring. The real one is at this museum, and we'll see it later. There's also a Soviet cap. 
This is the military uniform of Soviet cosmonaut Major General Alexei Leonov, one of Russia's most beloved space heroes. He was the first human to walk in space in 1965, and he was the commander of Soyuz during the Apollo Soyuz mission. And there you can see the hammer and sickle emblem on his hat. This garment was used by Stafford during his preparations for the Apollo 10 mission to the moon in May of 1969, which was the dress rehearsal for the moon landing of Apollo 11. It shows him upside down in a zero gravity chamber. He used this water gun during the Apollo 10 mission to rehydrate the delicious space food. This hand controller armrest was removed by Stafford from the Apollo 10 lunar module prior to the spacecraft being jettisoned. This is a stowage bag assembly used aboard Apollo 10. And this flashlight was carried to the moon on Apollo 10. This was Stafford's checklist used to perform the rendezvous procedure with the angry alligator during the Gemini 9 mission. During the Apollo Soyuz linkup, Stafford and Deke Slayton went into the Soyuz spacecraft, and they ate from these tubes of borscht, beet soup, offered by the cosmonauts. They even have vodka labeling on them. This is an emergency oxygen mask from the Apollo Soyuz mission, and this one saved the life of Tom Stafford during the final minutes of the flight. During re-entry, the command module's control system was sucked up into the ventilation system, so Stafford and the two other astronauts were immediately exposed to toxic fumes, and they quickly put on their oxygen masks and it saved all three of them. That is a burnt up segment of the Apollo 10 heat shield, showing the effects of the spacecraft's record breaking re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere. This is an Apollo Rendezvous radar antenna. This was part of the first solid state electronic radar system used in space. This ejection seat is from a Gemini spacecraft. It would be used in case of an emergency during launch, and Stafford nearly had to use his during an attempted launch when an electrical connector improperly disconnected, shutting the engines down. There's a cast mold of the Stafford statue, and a Wright Brothers first flight mini monument. Speaking of the Wright Brothers, now we go back in time to 1903 and the first flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina with this full-scale replica of the Wright Flyer. This is actually a working flyable replica of the supposed first heavier-than-air engine-powered aircraft. There you can see Orville preparing to successfully fly for 12 whole seconds. Here's a bicycle workbench. The Wright brothers owned a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio, and built the Wright Flyer in the back room of their shop, the one that's now at Greenfield Village. Here's a miniature model of the Wright Flyer. The real one is at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. I have made a video there if you're interested. This is a model of the wind tunnel constructed by the Wright brothers in 1901 for aerodynamic research that would become critical to their successful flights. There's yet another miniature Wright Flyer, and that is a piece of the original fabric from the 1911 Wright EX Vin Fizz, the first aircraft to fly across the country coast to coast, though it took almost three months. Here's an old radial engine still in working condition. This section is filled with replicas of important aircraft from the Smithsonian's collection. This is a replica of the Blériot 11, the first aircraft to cross the English Channel by Louis Blériot in 1909. What's interesting about that crossing is that it proved that island nations like England could be invaded from the air now, that no place or nation was immune to attacks anymore. That is a replica Curtis Pusher, one of the first airplanes to be built in quantity. It was also the type which made the first takeoff and landing from the deck of a ship. This is a full-scale replica of the Spirit of St. Louis, in which Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly a solo, non-stop flight across the Atlantic Ocean. There's even a wax figure of Charles Lindbergh, who became one of the biggest celebrities of his day. Unlike the real plane at the Smithsonian, this one is grounded. So they have it opened up and you can see what it was like in the claustrophobic cockpit, where Lindbergh was cooped up for 33 hours and 30 minutes. 
He didn't even have room to stretch his legs in here. And he apparently sat in a lawn chair. This is a real Sopwith pup. One of the first fighter planes made by the British. The pup served on the Western Front during the Great War and was one of the first planes to use a mechanically synchronized machine gun that allowed it to fire between the blades of a rotating propeller. There's a replica of the infamous Hindenburg, a Nazi airship which blew up at a New Jersey airfield. The disaster was highly publicized back in 1937. Here's an original newspaper stating that 30 were killed. There were actually more. That is a replica of the glamorous Glennis, the Bell X-1 rocket plane that became the first aircraft to punch through the sound barrier, piloted by Chuck Yeager, who recently passed away. Walking through the 747 engine cow ring into this exhibit on more modern Air Force planes. This is an F-86 Sabre fighter, America's first swept-wing jet fighter. These became particularly popular during the Korean War, and this one in particular was one of General Stafford's favorites to fly. This is a Soviet Mikoyan Garavik MiG-21 fighter aircraft, which became known by NATO as the Fishbed. It was the most produced jet fighter in history, and it served as a frontline fighter for nearly all of the Soviet bloc countries during the Cold War. This Fishbed was flown by General Stafford while he was the commander of the Air Force's Flight Test Center, as well as Area 51. Cosmonaut Alexei Leonov of the Apollo Soyuz mission passed away recently in October of 2019, but he was here at the museum for the 40th anniversary of Apollo Soyuz in 2015, and he signed this MIG-21. You can climb up and view the cockpit of this Soviet fighter. Also you can see the other aircraft from above. That is an F-16 Fighting Falcon, a fighter partially developed under the direction of General Stafford. It can pull more than 9G maneuvers and can reach a top speed of Mach 2. There's also a full-scale replica of the Little Boy, the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan in 1945. Over 66,000 people were killed as a direct result of the blast and 69,000 were injured and thousands more died later as a result of those injuries. This is a T-38 Talon Trainer. Stafford was the project test pilot for this aircraft, the world's first supersonic training aircraft. These were very successful, were often used by the NASA astronauts, and are still used to this day. Here's a large collection of model planes. This is one of the only remaining V-2 rocket engines left in existence. These were developed by the Nazis during World War II, and the V-2 is considered the first operational ballistic missile in world history. There's a replica of Sputnik, and a whole exhibit on rockets. This is a replica of the Goddard rocket. Dr. Robert Goddard developed and launched the first successful liquid-fueled rocket in 1926 using a similar rocket and stand. Those are some big old rocket engines. And here are some mini model replicas of rockets from around the world. These are Chinese CNSA rocket models. China does now have one of the most advanced space programs. There are historic US and Soviet rockets of the space race, side by side. They got a lot bigger and more advanced as the Cold War progressed. Here are some future launch vehicles planned by NASA for the Orion spacecraft, including Ares 4 and Ares 1, though I'm pretty sure Orion is cancelled now. This is an F-1 rocket engine, the largest and most powerful ever built. Five of these powered the Saturn V moon rocket, they generated more than 176 million horsepower, and each engine burned a swimming pool amount of fuel each second. This is LR-87, 
The engine that launched the Titan II missile. This is a Soviet NK-33 rocket engine. It was the highest performing liquid oxygen and kerosene engine ever built. That is a part of the Saturn V Apollo service module. These are the contents of an Apollo survival kit, which provided 48 hours of survival supplies for the three-man crew while they waited to be rescued. This is a model of the historic Apollo Soyuz link-up in space also known as the ASTP, which was a really big deal back in 1975. These American and Soviet flags were flown in space during Apollo Soyuz and were autographed by the crews. This American $1 bill was flown aboard Soyuz 19 during the mission, and these autographed insignias were also flown aboard. The early Soviet cosmonauts formed the Last Man's Club, a pact in which the surviving cosmonauts maintain contact with each other and give each other vodka. Here's a very unique case, a collection of Russian gifts that have been given to Stafford over the years. That is a Russian triple barrel handgun. The cosmonauts carry these guns aboard Soyuz as part of their survival kits, not intended to fend off aliens, but instead to use upon their return to Earth while they wait to be rescued. Here are some photos and autographs from when the crew members of Apollo and Soyuz visited President Gerald Ford at the White House. That is a piece of wire from Apollo Soyuz. Very cool souvenir. This Russian lacquer swan was gifted to Stafford by Valentina Tereskova, the first woman to ever fly in space. And that is a pressure gauge from Soyuz 19. Here are some other Russian gifts and medals, including some given to him by Brezhnev and Vladimir Putin. I'm pretty sure that's a bust of Vladimir Lenin. And there's also a hammer and sickle handkerchief. This is the real Apollo Soyuz docking ring. This specially designed ring connected the American and Soviet spacecrafts in space in a very historic and iconic rendezvous. Through this hatch, Stafford and Leonov exchanged a handshake, which contributed to the thawing of the Cold War. And here the crew autographed the international space hatch of mutual understanding. This was Commander Stafford's ATSP practice garment and headgear, with his wax head inside the suit. And this wax figure of Colonel Alexei A. Leonov is in his actual Soyuz flown cosmonaut garment. This is the probe and drogue docking assembly. This is a model of the International Space Station, which resulted from the Apollo-Soyuz mission. The checklist on the right was flown to the moon and used on Apollo 10 by Stafford and Gene Cernan. That flag was also flown to the moon on Apollo 10. I mentioned that that mission was like a dress rehearsal for the moon landing of Apollo 11, though Stafford never got to walk on the moon. That four-dish antenna array was attached to the rear of the Apollo 10 module to provide voice, TV, and data communication links with Earth. Here's a collection of artifacts and memorabilia related to the Apollo missions, resulting in the successful moon landing with Apollo 11. Lots of these relics were flown aboard Apollo modules and used by the astronauts. There are some biomedical sensors and accessories. There are some space food, garments, badges, and a water gun from the Apollo flights. That glove in the box was worn by Charles Conrad Jr. on the moon with Apollo 12, the second moon landing in November of 1969. He was the third person to ever walk on the moon. And those are Stafford's office shoes. This is the actual space shuttle fixed base simulator that was at the Johnson Space Center in Houston and was used for training for more than 30 years for practice with the space shuttle's main cockpit. In the past, the space shuttle, Saturn V, and IB rockets were carried over three miles to the launch pad aboard a giant crawler, and this is one of the actual crawler shoes from it that slowly carried the rockets along Cape Canaveral. There's even more awesome space program artifacts in this room. This is absolutely incredible. 
I've now seen several of these dispersed at museums across the country, but this is one of the original mission control consoles from Space Center Houston. This potato computer was used from the early Gemini missions, to the Apollo moon landings, to Skylab, to Apollo Soyuz, and the early space shuttle program. This is a complete Gemini spacecraft. It's never been to space, but it is the way it would appear while in orbit. During re-entry on the real modules, the large white colored equipment modules on the back were blown off to expose the rear heat shield, and the front half was jettisoned for the parachutes. Gemini 6 in 1965 achieved the first successful rendezvous with another spacecraft, Gemini 7. There's a Gemini 9 space helmet and some other memorabilia. This is the actual spacesuit worn by Stafford on Apollo 10. Wearing this spacesuit, their module set the record for the fastest speed a human ever achieved during re-entry, 24,791 miles per hour. That record still stands and apparently will not be broken until someone returns from Mars. When is that ever going to happen? This is amazing. The actual Gemini 6 lunar module. Tom Stafford and Wally Shearer were inside this capsule when they performed the first rendezvous in space on December 15, 1965. This was a very significant achievement, not just because it was the first time, but also because without the ability to rendezvous, there could be no successful moon landings. It's really impressive that they have one of the real command modules here, and you can even see the backside where the heat shield was. This is a full-scale replica of an Apollo Command and Service module. The CSM would serve as the mothership of all Apollo Skylab and Apollo Soyuz missions. Since the astronauts rode in the conical-shaped front end, the command module, during launch and re-entry. This gigantic thing is the Titan II rocket, an original ICBM nuclear missile. NASA got a hold of a few of these and decided they would make the perfect booster to launch the Gemini spacecraft. Stafford rode two of these rockets into space with Gemini 6 and 9, and this is one of the few original Titan II missiles still in existence, though this one always held a nuclear warhead. It weighed out the Cold War in a Kansas missile silo. Luckily, it never had to be launched. Here's a Mark VI nuclear warhead, the type that tipped the Titan II over there, but it once contained more than 600 times the explosive power of the little boy. There's astronaut Snoopy right there by the nuclear warheads. Here's a model of the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the greatest astronomical tools since Galileo's telescope. It's been up in space for a long time, and it's taken some awesome images. There's Space Shuttle Orbiter's landing gear tires, those are big. And there's a model of the space shuttle. Here's Bonnie Dunbar's training suit. She is known as the Space Cowgirl. That is a Space Lab pellet, a platform used for mounting large instruments and experiments requiring exposure to space on Skylab. There's Stafford's Gemini pressure spacesuit used during preparations for Gemini 6 and 9, as well as a flight backup unit of the astronomical maneuvering unit used by Gene Cernan, various articles of astronaut gear, and these artifacts are related to the space shuttle missions to the ISS. I am extremely impressed with this place, but there's some more stuff outside. This is an Apollo boilerplate used for landing and naval recovery training. It was also used to test the flotation devices after splashdown. This is an A-10 Warthog, also known as the Thunderbolt II. This is the Air Force's primary low-altitude close air support aircraft. These were used in the Gulf Wars, the Balkans, and in Afghanistan. I really like that they painted a face on this more modern Air Force plane. This here is a T-33 trainer shooting star. General Stafford probably became very familiar with these. And out alongside old Route 66, there's this F-4 Phantom. The Stafford Air and Space Museum was a pleasant surprise. Such an amazing collection, 
and I would count this among the greatest air and space museums in America. I would highly recommend a visit to this museum. I'd say it'd even be a good stop on a Route 66 road trip. Please check out my other videos on air and space related museums and all sorts of things. And also consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.